Hello, I'm Beth Quinn from the National Center for Women and Information Technology. In this video, we'll cover some key ways you can communicate more inclusively, both in and outside of the classroom and the lab. We'll begin with the four elements of inclusive communication and end with an introduction to critical listening. Note that this video assumes that you have some familiarity with the concept of bias and how it operates in society. No matter who we are, anytime we communicate, we're presented with an opportunity to be inclusive or not. In this video, we'll build on your understanding of bias. That is, you already understand that it exists in society, our systems, and ourselves, and you're able to recognize many of its different forms. Now we'll explore how to respond to it in our communications. There are two ways that this can happen. First, we can work to eliminate exclusive or unconsciously biased behavior and language, especially those that are part of long established habits or patterns of speech. Second, we can actively use language that is inclusive and models how we'll all, we can all be champions of inclusions within our work. Here we present ways to do both. It's important to remember that we're always sending signals to our audiences with everything we say and do, as well as what we don't say or do. Therefore, we wanna be aware of the explicit and implicit messages that we're sending so that we can be effective at confronting bias as well as promoting inclusivity. There are four elements of communication we wanna talk about. The first is the phys physical space or environment. Um, then there's nonverbal signals such as body language, eye contact. Uh, then there's uh, verbal messages and language. And finally, uh, the way we structure our interactions with our audiences, in this case with our students and others in our, in our uh, departments. The first element is physical space. You might be surprised to know that physical space is important in communication. The objects, signage, and decor within an environment can signal who does and who does not belong, what kind of culture and values the inhabitants have, and what kind of behaviors are likely to happen there. These environments may be formal spaces, such as lecture halls and classrooms or department offices, or they may be more informal, such as hallways, break rooms, or even the spaces outside a building. Regardless, Research has shown that environmental cues that reflect the white male dominated technology stereotype can make minorities, including women, feel pretty uncomfortable. These include typical man cave images and objects like geeky sci-fi or superhero objects, crude posters, frat style decor, and general uncleanliness, as opposed to more professional, clean, gender and race neutral environments that signal that all are welcome. When in doubt about the signals a space may be giving, make sure to gather the opinions of a diverse set of people. Also, in some cases, you may not have control over the physical environment. But even then, you may be able to counteract some of the messages by how you behave and communicate within those spaces. So let's talk about nonverbal signals. These include eye contact. So people tend to make eye contact with people who are most like them. This familiarity may be because of gender, ethnicity, age, or even appearance or other factors. So to practice inclusive communication, don't forget to also make eye contact with those who are not like you. And then there's body language. Facial expressions, gestures, and posture are the most obvious elements of body language. Smiling with open arms and palm up hands are universal signals for inclusion. Making your gestures posture and eye contact all congruent with your message signals clarity and honesty. For example, what does your body language say to students who come to your office hours? Vocal quality. The volume, tone, and rhythm of speech convey how you feel about what you're saying. Yelling at high speeds sends a very different signal than welcoming and conversational speech. Consider the following slightly more subtle examples. Okay, people, we got a lot to cover, so save your question for the end and let's get started. Okay, people, we got a lot to cover, so save your questions for the end and let's get started.
be intentional about how you use these tools to support inclusivity in your message. The third element is verbal language itself, the words we use and don't use when we speak and write. The following tips are applicable to how you lecture or run labs, uh, how your assignments are written, or um, how you communicate in informal spaces such as um, office hours. Here are some general tips for using inclusive language. First, consider your content. Is it inclusive of different people and perspectives? If it isn't, how can you make it so? Try alternative approaches for your message and get feedback from colleagues, friends, and students. Then consider if your language level is appropriate to your audience. So for example, avoid slang. Slang is one way that groups actually signal insider and outsider status. Uh, jargon is just a slang of a profession. So to be inclusive as possible, try to avoid both slang and jargon. Um, and if you must use specialized language, in, include definitions. So instead of saying, today we're gonna work on SEO, try today we're gonna work on search engine optimization or SEO. Use examples everyone can relate to um, rather than gender or culture specific niche or insider examples. When this isn't easy, try to use more than one example to be relevant to a wider audience. Then try to avoid he, she, and you pronouns in favor of we, our, and us whenever possible. Most people, you know, or some people might say that this isn't a big deal. But what it actually does is two things. First, it keeps you from explicitly gendering an example so they remain more inclusive. And uh, second, it is explicitly inclusive of trans and non-binary individuals. Then, this is a good one, avoid invoking harmful stereotypes in stories, metaphors, jokes, and examples. Unless you are a comedian in a comedy context, this is a recipe for disaster in any professional communication and probably in most personal ones. And then finally, practice. A lot of teaching is very improvisational, so it may be very hard to break some habits of speech, such as saying, you guys, record yourself or have a colleague or TA secretly flag you when you slip into old habits until you're using more inclusive language becomes natural. Consider the following two examples. Try to pick out the exclusive and inclusive uh, signals. Example one. Okay, guys, let's start with an example of SEO strategies for a B2B company. Let's call it uh, company X. Tell you what, in an effort to be inclusive as possible, let's say it's a makeup and perfume supply company for retailers. That way we're being relevant to the ladies too. Uh, let's call it company XX. <laughs> now, if the VP says he wants to maximize SEO, increase web traffic, click-throughs and conversions and customer LTV, let's take a look at his team's options. So what'd you pick up? Let me give you some help by providing a more inclusive way to communicate the exact same professional information. Okay, everybody, let's start with an example of search engine optimization or SEO strategies for a business selling to other businesses, also called B2B sales. Let's call it company X and pretend they sell, I don't know, plastic. Let's say company X wants to maximize search engine optimization, increase web traffic, generate new online leads for plastic sales, and ultimately increase repeat business. So let's take a look at their options. Next, let's turn to classroom interactions, kind of the fourth aspect of inclusive communication and one example of it. Um, and so this is applicable to both large lectures or smaller lab sections. So here are some tips that apply broadly for inclusive communications. Actually, you can use this when you speak at conferences, uh, you give a keynote, uh, any type of presentation. First, listen. If you ask students to contribute or audience uh, members to contribute, listen authentically with a spirit of inquiry and an intent for all to learn. 
Then invite others to react and contribute, including women and minorities, but be ready to confront potential stereotype threat by making a safe place for quieter or isolated people to participate. Then during group activities or discussions, model inclusive behavior and be ready to intervene in micro inequities, such as someone getting interrupted or not getting credit for their ideas. And don't rely on or solicit token women and minorities or even majority group members to speak for or represent their entire identity group. And signal respect and inclusion by allowing time for responses and acknowledging contributions before moving on. Finally, to be an inclusive communicator, we must also learn to be critical listeners. That is, we must use our knowledge of unconscious and societal bias to spot red flag statements in our own language and in the language, language of others. And we must be ready to ask questions that confront such biases and misconceptions. So let's try it. Listen to the following gender related statements. Try to identify if it's an example of one, fix the minority approach to diversity, Two, essentialism, which ascribes inequities to essential or innate causes. Or three, framing events as minority issues rather than issues that involve everyone. Women just need to learn to be more confident. Fix the women approach. You know, women bring better communication and people skills to the workplace essentialism. Women want a family-friendly workplace, framing as minority issue or women's issues. Women are such great collaborators, essentialism. Learn to take up space, toot your own horn, fix the woman. Hey ladies, we need to stop holding ourselves back. Fix the woman. Women students need mentoring to succeed in their computing courses. Framing as a woman's issue. Men are such linear thinkers. Essentialism. Don't be afraid to negotiate. Just waltz on in there and ask for what you deserve. Fix the woman. Women and men just have different leadership styles. Essentialism. Now that you can spot these problematic statements, what do we do about them? For starters, look at your own communications from lectures to assignments you give to the committees you serve on for similar notions and make some changes. But if it's Coming from someone else, such as do, during audience interactions or in a classroom, uh, let's take a look at some response options. When you hear any of these statements, you can always ask the easy probing questions as Colleen Lewis of CS Teaching Tips advises. Uh, these are things that you use when you just need more time to think about a response, right? These buy you time. Uh, the first one is tell me more. I'm curious to hear uh, about what you think. And then the second one is, isn't it more complicated than that? But let's look uh, a little more in depth uh, with each of these types of statements. So what's going on in fix the minority or fix the woman approaches to diversity, as opposed to fix the environment approaches? While some fix the woman statements may be good advice that both women and men could benefit from, years of research demonstrates that it will do little, if anything, to change systemic underrepresentation. These statements ignore reasons why women may appear less confident or may not negotiate. They fail to recognize that sometimes these actually may be smart strategies in a system that treats them differently. Being assertive and taking charge can sometimes backfire for women, resulting in personality penalties, for example. When you hear these statements, in addition to the buy the more time, tell me more kind of statement, or the generic, isn't it more complicated than that, you might ask, what if, and then whatever the advice is, backfires. Now let's look at uh, some research-based information 
that will help you um, discuss these statements. Uh, many women and men might benefit from learning to be or appear more confident, but at best it will only help those individuals. It's not going to help patterns of underrepresentation. Another tack you can take is just because women seem less confident doesn't mean they actually are. How they behave could be a result of stereotype threat or the environment they're currently in. Uh, finally, suggesting women be more confident or assertive fails to recognize that there are sometimes advantages to behaving diplomatically or less assertively. Now let's turn to statements that draw from uh, essentialism. Um, so these are statements that overgeneralize or exaggerate exaggerate similarities among women or among men, such as statements that imply that traditionally male or female characteristics are innate, or that portray women and men as essentially and fundamentally different. They ignore the vast range of differences between all women, even between women of the same age, race, and class. They also ignore the huge role um, that how we are raised plays and the societal norms continue to play in who we are and in influencing our behavior. They also ignore the fact that women and men are in fact more similar than different. So when you hear these statements, in, in addition to the by the time response, tell me more, or the generic, isn't it more complicated questions, you might also ask, all women, all men, which women or which men? And then also, how do you account for variations among women, men, or other groups? Some research-based responses, so digging into it a little bit uh, more deeply, you can note that it doesn't apply to all women and men, that differences we see are likely not innate, but rather socially influenced tendencies, and when they do apply, uh, they're often context dependent and not always true even of that individual. For example, sometimes some women, largely due to how they've been raised, do express different leadership styles. But in public conversation, these differences are often really exaggerated. Let's turn to issues with framing events as only women's issues. These statements frame the issue as something that's primarily important for women or as a special help that women need. Uh, what's going on with these statements? First, these statements often uh, are mixes of essentialism and fix the woman within arguments for particular policies. For example, flexible work policies, mentoring programs, tutoring or programs to build professional skills. By characterizing these programs as something only women need, they mistakenly imply that only women have these needs, and in some cases, that they are deficient or not the norm. Thus, these statements may reinforce stereotypes about women and evoke stereotype threat for some women. Second, these statements and the policies that follow can disadvantage others who may also have these needs. For example, men are participating more in childcare and express a desire to be involved parents, but often they feel less able than women to utilize work policies that enable greater family involvement. Third, by narrowly framing these issues, say of work-life balance, we may limit the base of support for the policy or program and ultimately undermine our inclusivity work. So when you hear these statements, ask those same probing questions, the by time, tell me more, the generic, isn't it more complicated, and then the all women are men, or which women are men, and then the how do you account for variations among women, men, and other groups. Some uh, research-based information you can use in these discussions is um, to try to talk about the benefits of policies being framed as beneficial and for the use for everyone. Um, that really will uh, increase your base. Um, and that form formal policies often aren't enough. Any conversation about programs that, for example, support work-life balance must include strategies to encourage people to actually use them.
In conclusion, no matter what the context for your professional communication, to be effective as possible, strive to signal inclusion in all the ways that you communicate, including verbally and non-verbally, in your writing and in your physical environment. Model inclusive behaviors and mindsets and help build environments where anyone can feel they belong.